6,000 miles, 13 days, 12 states, and a Fiat Spider with my spouse. Am I crazy or will this be the trip of a lifetime? I'll break it all down for you, the stops, the gas mileage, where the car excelled and where it didn't. But just a little background here, I act as one of two volunteer organizers for Rally North America. Since 2010, we've put on a multi-day, typically 1,500-mile automotive scavenger hunt to benefit a charity. We've raised over $2 million in direct donations as a group since that time. We produce a television series, which can be seen on Map TV. This year, our event started in Durango, Colorado. Now, I live in central Pennsylvania, so getting to the start was 1,900 miles away, if we went straight there. However, my wife has never been west of Ohio in a car, and I wanted to show her our country, or at least some of the highlights on the way out. We would wing this trip, no reservations. I had a few locations in mind to visit, but we would let the cards fall where they may. Our first stop was Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Waterhouse. It's built partially over a waterfall in Fayette County, Pennsylvania. It is described as a masterpiece of architectural engineering, one of Frank Lloyd Wright's best works. Surprisingly to us, anyway, it's closed for tours only on Tuesday. And of course, we arrived on Tuesday. So strike one on the winging it plan. Next, we visit the West Virginia State Penitentiary in Moundsville, West Virginia. Fortunately, they were open, and within 15 minutes, we could tour the location. Nice. Operating as a prison from 1876 to 1995, this location saw its share of murder, mayhem, executions, and even a riot that drew national attention in 1986. In 1983, convicted multiple murderer Charles Manson requested to be transferred to this prison to be nearer to his family. Of course, his request was denied. The tour there was very informative. It lasted about an hour. It's certainly worth the $12 entry fee, and, and we definitely recommend it. We ended the day in Zanesville, Ohio, which was fine, excluding the tornado warning sirens, which locals claimed they never really heard before. Fortunately for us, we didn't see a tornado, at least not that day. We begin day two on the interstate, Route 70. This is not the ideal place for the spider. We have the upgraded Bilstein shocks, and the concrete highway provides somewhat of a bumpy, jarring ride at interstate speeds. We next stop at Hartman Rock Garden, which is a garden behind a residence. The construction started in 1932 when Ben Hartman lost his job. Ben decided to stay busy during his layoff and began constructing a cement fishing pond. And it took off from there for the remaining 12 years of his life. Ben filled his yard with over 50 structures, countless handmade figurines, using hundreds of thousands of stones. After his death, his wife Mary took on the upkeep of the garden until her passing in 1997. In 2008, the Kohler Foundation purchased and restored Ben and Mary's unusual masterpiece. It's worth a visit should you find yourself outside of Springfield, Ohio. I-70 through Indianapolis is closed this summer due to construction. This gives us the perfect excuse to stop at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum. The museum is located within the infield of the speedway itself. It's open to the public. It's full of IndyCar and speedway history. and is a must-stop if you're a motorsports fan. Our next stop was Casey, Illinois. If you have never heard of it, put it on your list of places to stop. Their town motto is Big Things, Small Town, and they are not joking. Their list of verified world's largest items includes the following. World's largest wind chime, world's largest golf tee, world's largest pitchfork, world's largest rocking chair, world's largest wooden shoes, world's largest barbershop pole, world's largest golf driver, and there's quite a few other world's largest, but I'm getting tired. Plus, there's 20 other big attractions located in a small Midwestern town with a total population of only 2,700 people. We really enjoyed our time in this town. We made sure to see as many of the large items as we could fit into a two-hour window. We spent the night just east of the Missouri border so we could detour slightly and visit the St. Louis Arch. Many of you have seen the Gateway Arch in photos or on television, but the size of the monument is hard to grasp until you get right up to it. It's quite large and much more impressive up close. We made our way through Missouri, stopping only for fuel in an occasional iconic shopping location, Hello Ozark Land. We detour again, this time to Wamego, Kansas, home of the Oz Museum. This small town features one of the world's largest collection of Wizard of Oz items located in one place. You could easily spend hours there if you had the time and the interest. We took in as much as we could in about an hour and a half. We made sure to walk the Yellow Brick Road across the street and then back onto I-70. We stopped in Abilene, Kansas, hometown of President Eisenhower. Unfortunately, all the locations related to our past president had closed by the time we arrived, but it was also the location of the world's largest spur. By that time, my wife had grown tired of the world's largest anything and wanted to stop for dinner, but that didn't deter me from stopping at the world's largest check egg. I mean, look at that thing. It's really big egg. We spent an uneventful night in Quinter, Kansas. 
The following day, we knock out the remaining miles in Kansas and head towards, you may have guessed it, Pikes Peak. What better place to take someone who has never seen a mountain of this size up close than straight up the mountain? For those that have never been to Pikes Peak, on a clear day, it provides awesome views, and the driving, even at lower speeds, is still fun. So with the top down, we went up. The Spider did not enjoy the altitude going up as much as we did the views the convertible provided. I could feel the turbo working overtime, and at 8,500 feet, the air conditioning was turned off and sport mode was engaged to give us a little more power. At 12,000 feet, much more throttle was required to climb the steep switchbacks. It was so much more throttle than what was required just 10 minutes earlier. At 13,000 feet, all traffic was being turned around as the park was preparing for the following week's hill climb. Both us and the car were okay with this arrangement. I'm happy to report the little spider was perfectly content going down the mountain. I did not apply much braking. I kept it in third gear most of the way down as the little car carved its way through the turns. There is a brake check station roughly a third of the way down the mountain where a ranger temperature checks your brakes. We saw multiple large SUVs, trucks, and other cars get waved into the cool down area, whereas we were told, your brakes look great, go ahead and proceed. So we did. We made our way to our final hotel prior to the event's kickoff. The best western movie manner. The rear of the hotel faces a drive-in theater. From your bed in your room, you can watch a movie playing at the drive-in. And the hotel provides a switch and speaker set up in the room, so you can listen to it as well. In part two of our journey, the rally begins. We drive the Million Dollar Highway in Colorado. It's a really awesome road, both scenically and from a driving perspective. It goes through some old mining towns. Just a neat place to visit. We also visit Mesa Verde, and I have lots of video and all that stuff. If you want to see the tune-up for this trip and what you know we tried to do to, to get us ready for this one, check out this video over here. There's a lot there about the spider and how to do it the right way and the wrong way. I thanks so much for, for watching this video. It is appreciated. I appreciate you coming along for the trip. Until next time, we'll see you.